Uh, good morning to everyone and welcome to Cutsite Christian Church on Sunday the 29th of March. Uh, I hope you have remembered to move your clocks forward to British summertime. And also a big thank you to all of you who have been keeping in touch with people by phone and email and through the church's WhatsApp group over this last week and a half. When you look at the exchanges that have taken place, it's really encouraging to see the amount of care and concern that has been shown for each other in these difficult times. This will be the second weekend that we haven't met together as a church and I'm really missing the times when we can be together as a fellowship and I hope that when this is all over, the church will come out of it much stronger than we were when we were at the start. If you're not in the church's WhatsApp group, I would encourage you to um, get in touch with Helen and get her to put you on that group and be part of what's happening there. There's been a lot of good stuff going on there and it'd be good if everybody was part of it. Today we're going to be looking at Joseph, the end product. But as I pondered the last five chapters of the book of Genesis, I felt that we had to spend just some time thinking about Jacob as well as Joseph. So here we go. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 8 says this, The end of a matter is better than its beginning. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? I just want to put that as a head into what we're looking at this morning. Genesis 45 and verses 25 through 28. Um, what's happened here is that, you know, Joseph has been sold into Egypt. He's now become a second in charge of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. And he's masterminding their survival plan and their economics during the years of plenty and famine. His brothers have gone down and they've bought grain and all the rest of it and Joseph is now aware that his father Jacob is still alive so he sends them back to Canaan and tells them tell Jacob to come down here and I'll look after him and the whole family and there's about 70 of them so Joseph sends the brothers back and with them he sends carts back to Canaan to bring Jacob and the family down now when the brothers get back to Canaan they say to Jacob, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is ruler of all Egypt. Now, given the track record of Jacob, his mother Rebecca, and his uncle Laban, and his family, I don't even be surprised to realize that Jacob just says, I don't believe you. And they told him everything that Joseph had said to them. And it says in verse 27 when Jacob saw the carts Joseph was sent to carry him back the spirit of the father revived and he went on to say I'm convinced my son Joseph is still alive I will go and see him before I die now these carts don't think of them in terms of cattle trucks these would have been the Egyptian equivalent of a cavalcade of Rolls Royces that have been sent from the man in charge of Egypt to bring his father Jacob down to Egypt. Jacob was going to be moving house in style. Now whether you move house in style or not, it is a stressful experience, even when you're moving within your own locality. But to move to a place with which you're just totally unfamiliar, a place where you're pretty much on your own knowing nobody, well, if you've never done it before, let me tell you, that is an extremely stressful experience. And it's a huge step, and it's even bigger when you have responsibility for other people whose futures were going to be greatly affected by the move. It's not a step that you take lightly. So in Genesis 46, 1, it says there, So Israel set out with all that was his, and they came to Beersheba. In a time of famine, Jacob's grandparents had gone down to Egypt, and it was a disaster. That was Abraham and Sarah. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 12. In another time of famine, Jacob's father, Isaac, 
was told explicitly by God, do not go down to Egypt. And you read about that in Genesis 26. Now here is Jacob, he's in a time of famine. And what is he thinking about? He's on his way to Egypt. Was he betraying his past, his heritage? Was he turning his back on all that had gone before in his family? After all, where he was was the promised land, the land that he was to inherit. How could he leave that with all the hopes and aspirations that were bound up in that land? He could have looked to the past and concluded that going down to Egypt was an absolute nono. He could have been asking, why are the old days better than these? I suppose that we get to a time in life when we think that our best days are in the past. And the dreams and ambitions of our youth are become a distant memory. Some of them have been achieved, many of them we haven't achieved them. And it may be we get to the point where we no longer have any ambitions or things that we want to achieve for the Lord. Jacob could have been like that. It has been decades since uh, Jacob has had an experience with God. The Lord has spoke to him all these years ago concerning the land that he was now living in. You read of that in Genesis 35. God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you and kings will come from your body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you. I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from the place where he had talked with Jacob. Since then, there had been no vision or word from the Lord. Yet God's covenant promises are bound up in that land. And this was the last word that um, Jacob had heard from the Lord. And here is Jacob contemplating leaving all this to go to Egypt of all places. When you're forced to face changes and you change your circumstances and all of that, make sure that you take into account all the words that the Lord has spoken. You see, a long time before this, God has spoken to Abraham and he said, No for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not your own, and they will be enslaved and ill-treated for 400 years. Jacob, he could have clung on to the little that he now had and longed for the good old days, but he didn't do that. He set out with all that was his. But it wasn't going to be a non-stop journey to Egypt. When he reached Beersheba, he offers sacrifice to the God of his father Isaac. And in Genesis 46, verses 2 through to 4, it says there that God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And Jacob replied, Here I am. And God said, I am the God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you and I will surely bring you back again and Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. It was the God of his father who was speaking. And what is important is not the things that a previous generation of believers did and how they did it, but that they served God, but that we serve God whom they served and that we are open to what God wants to be doing through us. God's will for Isaac was, you shall, shall not go down to Egypt. God's will for Jacob was that he should go down to Egypt. And this was going to be Jacob's finest star. He had messed up big star with his wife Leah, and in the way that he had treated her. He had messed up with his children and the favoritism that he had shown Joseph. His family life had just been chaotic. And for 22 years he had lived under the cloud of sorrow and self-pity regards his favourite son Joseph thinking that he was dead. For some of us, that's maybe where we are. The grits of the past are stacked high and they're weighing in upon us. Or it may be we have 
family situations that we see no way out of and the future just looks to be getting darker. Maybe you have children as far as spiritual life is concerned. You think they're dead and that brings in with it a depth of sorrow that's agonizing for you. God was going to give Jacob an opportunity to rectify the mistreatment of his family and to do what he could in respect to Leah. And God's dealing with Israel teaches us one thing. Never give up hope no matter our failings. There's a family in America called the Hoppers. I think you call them gospel singers of the southern gospel type style I suppose you would call it. They sing a song and the title of the song is Grace Will Always Be Greater Than Sin. This is what some of the words are. Broken and bruised from the choices you've made, sin has a price and so often you've paid. Oh but Jesus is waiting, new hope is in him and grace will always be greater than sin. Grace will always be greater than sin. Calvary has proven it time and again. Whatever you've done, wherever you've been, God's grace will always be greater than sin. Maybe you're listening to this and you're not a Christian. Maybe you've messed up big time and you don't know where to turn to. Can I tell you that there's only one place you can go? And that is Calvary. Because at Calvary you'll discover that grace is always far bigger than your mistakes. Joseph is in Egypt. Jacob has arrived. And he sends Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions. They didn't have Satnav. They were going to a place in Egypt called Goshen. And when they arrived in the region of Goshen... Joseph gets sorted out with his say, chariot and he goes to Goshen to meet Israel, his father. And as soon as Joseph appeared before Jacob, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Israel said to Joseph, Now I am ready to die since I have been seen for myself that you are still alive. This was more than Jacob had ever hoped for. I've seen my son again, my favourite son, Joseph. But that wasn't all. In Egypt, Joseph has had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Joseph brings them to his father, Jacob, when he hears that his father, Jacob, is ill and is about to die. And Jacob's eyes aren't brilliant now. He can't see too well. And Jacob says to Joseph, who are these? says, they are my sons that God has given me here. And Joseph said to his father, Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, and now God has allowed me to see your children. And chapter 40 and verses 15 through 16 says that Jacob blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my father Abraham Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. Jacob, looking back over his long life, he recognizes that all along, through all the mistakes, God has been his shepherd all his life. And the angel of the Lord has delivered him from all harm. And Hebrews twelve, eight, Hebrews eleven twenty one says an interesting thing. It says, By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned upon his staff. A man called R.T. Kendall used to be the pastor at a Westminster Chapel in London. He said this, What makes us worship... It's when we see our gracious God as the backdrop to our folly, when our feeling of gratitude is beyond the capability of words, when all we can do is whisper, Thank you. Jacob and Leah, what about them? 
Leah was in a loveless marriage with um, Jacob. He didn't love her, he loved um, Rachel instead. But it was through Rachel that Judah was born. And from Judah you come down to King David and King Solomon and eventually you come to Jesus himself. Descended from Leah, not Rachel. Leah also had a son called Levi. And from Levi you come to Moses and Aaron and the priesthood and everything associated with that. And there was Moses and Aaron, they deliver, God used them to deliver Israel from Egypt and bring them to the promised land. That was through Leah. In chapter 49, verses 29 to 31, Jacob gives his sons these instructions. I'm about to be gathered to my people to die. Bury me with my fathers in the field of Machpelah near Mamre in Canaan, which Abram bought as a burial place from Ephraim the Hittite, along with the field. And listen to this. There Abram and his wife Sarah were buried. There Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried. And there I buried Leah. I think Abram has eventually woken up to the reality of what has been going on. He says, I don't want to be buried beside Rachel. I want to be buried beside Leah. Because there he recognized that God's plans are going to be fulfilled through the sons of Leah. In terms of Judah and the Lord. In terms of Levi and Moses. In the end Jacob recognizes that his own way of doing things are not God's way. Paul says in Romans 8.28 We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him have been called according to his purpose. And finally, <clears throat> when we come to Genesis chapter 50, Jacob has died, Joseph's brothers are a long way from home, and Joseph had a, he has a great deal of power in Egypt. The question is in their minds, is it now payback time? In Genesis 50 verse 16, the brothers, they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave us this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of your father. And when Joseph heard all of this, he just wept as they spoke to him. And Joseph said to them, I will provide for you and your little ones. And through this he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. Finally, I just want to speak very briefly on the nature of God's forgiveness. These brothers, ten of them, had done a great evil to Joseph. They now recognize that. They're repentant, they're sorrowful for it, for the impact it's had in Joseph, for the impact it's had in Jacob. All of that is true. They've asked for forgiveness from Joseph. They're begging him. and They think it's going to be payback time from Joseph. They haven't understood the nature of divine forgiveness. Hebrews chapter 10 says this. This is the covenant I will make with them after these days, declare the, the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. What is God saying? He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And God says to us, when we confess our sins, they are forgiven. He is saying, I will remember them no more. I will never, ever bring them up again. We have God's word for it. They will never, ever again be mentioned. You've messed up, we all have. 
the nature of God's forgiveness is this. When we look to the cross, we receive God's forgiveness. God says, they'll never be mentioned again. Grace is always greater than sin. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the story of Jacob and Joseph, how they're so intertwined with each other. And yet, Father, we see in Joseph a tremendous picture of the Lord Jesus and the forgiveness that he shows to these brothers, even in spite of all his suffering. And Father, we see in Jesus Christ a tremendous forgiveness and love, tremendous grace. The Apostle reminds us that where sin increased, where it abounded, grace increased and abounded all the more. Grace will always be greater than sin. Thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus for these studies in the life of Joseph. Amen. It would be great if those who are watching this now, you just moved into a time of prayer and just commit the fellowship to the Lord. And the people who are facing situations with work in these days, they are trying that God will just be with them and that we'll all come out of this much better and stronger people than we were when we went into it. The Lord bless you all and keep you. Amen.